I'd like to preface this story by acknowledging that the truthfulness or reliability of asylum or escaped mental patient stories tends to be questionable in my opinion. The reason why I'm skeptical of those stories is that large-scale closures of asylums began in 1967 through the 1980s and were completely decommissioned by 2015. So I raise my eyebrow whenever someone talks about spooky asylum stories that happened within the last two decades or so. Still, I'll be sharing my story as factually as my memory allows and refrain from exaggerating any aspect. I often visited my grandparents' home in Traverse City in northern Michigan during the summers with my parents. Traverse City is a beautiful place, produces 75% of the world's cherries, and was home to the Traverse City Regional Psychiatric Hospital, which operated from 1885 to 1989. Since the United States federal government officially deemed the hospital worthy of preservation for its historical significance, the buildings on the hospital grounds were guarded by patrolling security guards. The TC Psychiatric Hospital was massive, including 70 or 80 buildings of various sizes. Some buildings have now been converted into restaurants, gift shops, tourism traps, cafes, etc., but many remain empty and abandoned. Underneath the hospital is a sprawling brick tunnel system which the hospital staff used to safely transport the patients from building to building in the frigid winter temperatures. I am sure that there were instances where the patients underwent cruel treatments or were subjected to the care of horrible doctors, but the TC Psych Hospital had a great reputation. Many teenagers, including myself at the time, were unashamedly fascinated with the hospital and its history. As a result, we would often break into abandoned buildings through unbarred windows or doors with pickable padlocks. While there were a few cases where teens would get caught and charged with breaking and entering, as long as we were stealthy, stuck to our safe entrances, and paid attention to the guards' patrol patterns, we could go in and out without worry. I'm not advocating or trying to justify any criminal activity or breaking and entering, but Breaking into the old hospital was almost a rite of passage for the TC teens. The hospital's interior was terrifying. There was old, stained and broken equipment and furniture, crumbling floors and walls, vandalism, strange old building noises, and complete and utter darkness in the tunnels, basements and lower floors. Using flashlights was too risky with guards patrolling, so we often navigated the hospital by memory in our dimly lit phone screens. As you can imagine, our frightened youthful imaginations ran wild with horror stories, which is pretty ironic considering we made up most of those stories. Unfortunately, during my last trip inside, I encountered something that terrified me to the point that I swore off ever returning. The story takes place at around 10pm. The moonlight was dim and most patrol guards left for the day. Clad in black, my friend Jason and I entered through the same window we always used and followed our regular path to one of the tall jutting spires to sit by the windows that overlooked the entire city. There was only one thing different about this venture from our others. A new faint and unexplainable smoky odor. Not smoky like fire, but something more akin to incense. The smell was so faint that we almost thought that we were imagining it, but it grew stronger as we got closer to our destination. Rather than taking the stairs that led to the spire, we followed the smell down a different hallway until we reached a room with a deep red glow emanating from the doorway. Rather than doing the smart thing by leaving immediately, we couldn't resist the urge to walk closer and investigate. When we finally reached the room, I audibly gasped and felt Jason grip my wrist so hard his nails left marks on my skin. We found a large ring of red votive candles and burning incense circling a drawing of a pentagram with the sigil of Baphomet. In the center of the drawing was a dead, bloody bird surrounded by black feathers. Bear in mind that I was raised devoutly Catholic so seeing this image filled me with a sense of fear stronger and more paralyzing than any ghost sighting ever could. Later on that night, Jason told me I immediately started mumbling prayers, but I personally don't remember doing that. I wouldn't be too terribly surprised, though. While the duration felt infinite, 
I'm not sure how long we stared at this sort of occult scene before hearing a man's low and ominous voice behind us saying, Welcome. I promise you that there was absolutely nothing friendly about the way that guy greeted us. Jason and I immediately screamed bloody murder, whipping around, and saw two nicely dressed but frazzled looking adult men seemingly smiling at us. The man in front of me held something in his hand, and while I can't say for sure what it was, I remember thinking it might be a knife, which couldn't be too crazy of a guess considering they recently sacrificed a bird. Jason and I sprinted past the two, and I felt someone's fingers grab the back of my shirt. Thankfully, these two didn't have a solid grip on me because I ducked and managed to escape their grip. The men shouted for us to stop running. We obviously could not do that. We heard their footsteps chasing after us for a little while, but thankfully Jason and I had broken into the hospital so many times that running through the unlit rooms, hallways, and tunnels was pretty much like knowing the back of our hand. When we finally reached and vaulted through our escape window, these occultists were nowhere to be seen or heard. We kept running through the hospital grounds until we reached Jason's car with no concern for the patrol guards. We would have rather gotten caught by the guards than these occultists and I ended up puking twice in the parking lot, whether the cause was fear, sprinting non-stop for a mile and a half, or a combination of both. I'm not sure what would have happened if these two had caught us, but I know for certain that they weren't going to crack open a beer and sing Kumbaya by the candlelight. Now, I'm not familiar with cultic practices or satanic rituals, so I'm not sure what the men were trying to do or if they were summoning something or whatever. Jason and I never returned to that hospital during that summer or any of the following summers. While we aren't close now that we're adults, I know that horrifying experience will keep us cemented in each other's memories until we die. I'm sure by now everybody is caught up with watching the new Dahmer series on Netflix. It's been a while. I personally didn't know any real details about Jeffrey Dahmer until the show. After each episode, I realized Dahmer wasn't this crazy genius serial killer, but instead just some sick monster that got lucky with every murder because no one, especially the police, took any of the signs or calls serious enough to catch him from the first murders. To think he could have been stopped early on but wasn't due to police negligence is something that will never sit right with me, but that's not what I'm writing about. This series reminded me about a time in my life I unknowingly dated a literal serial psychopath. I can't go as far as to call him a murderer because he didn't actually murder anybody successfully. For protection, I'm changing names and leaving out a few details to not give away my identity. I was 22 when I met Kevin. He was older than me. I always dated men a bit older than me, but Kevin was 44 when we met. Now I know what you're thinking. No, he wasn't a sugar daddy ordeal. I met him through a friend whose job he frequented, and he most certainly didn't look 44. He was tall, fit, wore stylish clothes, super handsome, the whole nine yards. He looked maybe 36 or 38 at most, which is still a big age gap, but I didn't mind the gap. Anyway, she gave him my info as he was always very kind, handsome, and vented to my friend about wanting to date after his divorce, but didn't know how to start. Friend gave me the heads up, and although I was annoyed, after I saw what he looked like in a photo, I wasn't upset anymore. He was sweet, had good humor to him, and overall had an inviting personality to him, so we arranged a date after talking for a week or two. He asked me to drive over and meet him at his place, and he'll drive me to the restaurant. I know, seems sketchy, but I figured that he would be stupid if anything, and I had my location on and let a few friends know about what I was doing and with who in case something were to happen. I drove into an incredibly nice neighborhood and found this house, and all I can say was, wow. He greeted me and said, come inside, I'll pull the car out right now. I entered and waited for him to bring the car out of the garage, past the truck in the driveway. He pulled out this supercar, 
a model that would set you back 150000 I was shocked because I wasn't expecting to get into that kind of car. He noticed my surprise and said, I know, it's a lot, but I never have an excuse to drive it, so I figured tonight would be a good night to bring it out. I chuckled, and we were off for our date. We arrived at the restaurant, and he had reservations there, and as soon as we walked in, we received some very curious stares. It seemed strange, but I guess we looked like an odd couple, so I let it be. Throughout dinner, he was genuinely engaged in our conversation and interested in what I had to say. He spoke gently, focused entirely on me, and was very respectful. He wasn't in the least bit creepy or pervy, and overall, he was great at conversation. About an hour and a half passed, and he started opening up about his ex-wife. He told me he ended his relationship just shy of the eight-month mark. It had been a 90-day fiancé situation where he fell in love with a woman from another country that he met on a spiritual yoga retreat. However, it didn't work out after they married a stranger following a month-long vacation together. Shock her. Apparently, she had been draining him of a lot of money, starting fights, and they realized that they didn't have much in common. She ended up going back home after he had to pay thousands of dollars in divorce paperwork. I wasn't sure how to react, but his honesty made me trust him a bit more. The best way to describe this man was a complete charmer to provide some perspective. After dinner, we went back to his house for a glass of wine. Immediately upon entering beyond the entrance, I noticed cameras everywhere in the corner of every room. It was weird, but I figured it was for extra protection and security. He poured us some wine, and after just two more glasses, he fell asleep on the couch next to me. I was completely confused and weirded out, so I just quietly left and went home. I immediately told my friend, laughed it off, and just went to bed. The next morning, I woke up to a ton of texts from Kevin apologizing and expressing how embarrassed and shocked he was that he fell asleep. He wanted to redeem himself. I told him it was okay, understanding that we all have those days and embarrassing oneself when sober feels terrible. A day later, we went on our date again, following the same routine. After dinner, we returned to his place to chat away from the crowded bar. We were relatively sober, about three drinks in, when out of nowhere he asked, What are you into? I asked for clarification, and he proceeded to inquire about my physical preferences any kinks, etc. If it isn't already obvious, I'm into the daddy thing and dominance in a man, physically, financially, and emotionally. I told him it was mostly due to my actual daddy issues, and he excused himself to fetch something. He returned from the kitchen with a large leather suitcase. Before I could ask, he brought out chains, whips, and paddles of all sorts, revealing, this is what I like. My face turned a bit pink, I wasn't expecting that. He, the sweet, wholesome yogi, liked whips and chains. All right, I was into it, the best of both worlds. He then informed me that for our relationship to progress, I would have to sign three legal documents. I understood why he might want an NDA given his work, but I was curious about the other two. I'd had experience dating a man up there, so NDAs weren't new to me. When I asked about the other forms, he explained that both were consent forms, and one was a binding document stating that I couldn't sue him or press charges for anything that happened in the bedroom. I stared blankly at him, not sure what to say at that moment. We both glanced at the clock, realizing that it was late and agreed to discuss it further another time. I gave him a hug and headed home. During the entire drive, I replayed the last hour of our date in my head. The suitcase his body language, the look in his eyes when he brought up the contracts. It all felt incredibly... sinister. It was a feeling I'd never gotten from him, so being myself, I conducted a background check, and I couldn't believe what I discovered about this man. Now warning, the following information may be disturbing to some listeners. I'm unaware of his serious and casual relationships, but I do know that he was married twice and divorced twice. His first marriage lasted several years, I don't know the exact timeline, but his most recent, second marriage lasted only a few months, including the engagement period as this was the wife on a spousal visa. 
The first documents I found on this man were his traffic records. Everyone gets a ticket, not a big deal. However, he had enough DUIs and DWIs to completely suspend his license for a couple of years, suggesting that he had a drinking problem. After the never-ending traffic records, I found several of his social media profiles and his company website. Pretty normal so far. And then I stumbled upon the court documents. Every single trial, hearing, court case, and charge, everything was detailed. I didn't even know where to start. I guess I'll begin with the less severe stuff, but if you could even call it that. He used to tie up his ex-wife with silk ropes and bondage, not for consensual bedroom stuff, though that's how it started. Instead, he'd leave her tied up, defenseless, and watch her struggle for hours. He once left her tied up for so long that she had severe bruises and bloody blisters on her hands and ankles, and she was severely dehydrated. It was sickening. I won't use the R word as I'm sensitive to it, but... There's no need to delve into the details of how many times or the severity of it. Yes, he assaulted his wife and ex several times. At this point, I felt myself going pale. I couldn't imagine what it must have been like for those women. That wasn't even the worst part. He had her email, social media accounts, and her actual cell phone tapped. He even bugged the front-facing camera on her Android to turn on and off at his discretion. I couldn't fathom how he managed that. His possessiveness didn't end there. He tracked her location, bugged her phone and car, and showed up at her job, girls' dinners, and family homes, both during and after the relationship ended. He recorded many of their intimate moments and had a significant collection of his wife's personal photos, some consensual, but most were not. After a fight between them broke out, he leaked an intimate photo of them on his and her socials. If the said social site deleted the image after violating the terms and agreements or it was reported, he would simply re-upload it until the threat of permanent account termination. As if that isn't already disgusting and evil enough, he went as far as to mail intimate Polaroid pictures of his wife to her mother and father, attempting to tarnish their daughter's image. What kind of sick person would do that to their own in-laws? I paused after reading that. Unable to imagine what her parents must have felt, having their son-in-law betray their daughter and their trust like that. God, and that wasn't even the worst part. As I mentioned earlier, he had his license suspended and several DUIs and DWIs. As a result, he had to report regularly to a parole office. However, he wasn't on parole because of the DWIs. He was on parole because of the attempted murder of his ex-girlfriend. Yes, attempted murder. It wouldn't be long until he attempted the same with his ex-wife. I won't go into detail, I don't want to relive it, and I don't want to give away details, but just know that she was very lucky the neighbors got involved. There is a restraining order and protective order against Kevin by his exes and every member of their family. From the documents alone, I don't know how they're doing, honestly. I know the ex-wife went back to her home country and his other girlfriends I have no clue about. Crazy enough, this person didn't serve almost any jail time or prison time. I know he paid a lot in damages and I know his lawyers weren't cheap. He had to do a lot of community service, take several behavioral courses, and I know he served behind bars for a few months through the years. I don't think he was punished enough. I don't think he suffered enough. I don't think he ever realized the severity and impact of his actions. He permanently ruined the lives of these women and he just got a slap on the wrist. He's still driving his dream car, living in his dream house and somehow managed to keep his dream job. And these women, God I hope they're doing okay. One thought kept repeating over and over in my head. I was inside this man's home. I was alone. I was three feet away from potentially experiencing the trauma some of his exes went through. I thought he was charming. I thought he was wonderful. He was and still is a monster. I'm so thankful nothing happened and we didn't even share a kiss. God was truly watching over me that day. And after reading over the last few pages of the court documents, I felt nauseous, a little lightheaded and pretty much speechless. I didn't know what to think, what to feel. 
accepting that as my reality versus some story I read on Reddit left me shocked. Really, I think I'll make a part two to the story as I'm getting pretty tired and I can only handle talking so much about this. Needless to say, I cut all contact with him, went ghost, and he didn't bother with me much after that, but we did run into each other at the supermarket once and I felt paralyzed as we locked eyes. A monster, not some crazy fictional beast or ghost or evil spirit, just an everyday guy capable of unleashing real evil onto this earth. A man so sick and demented, he perfected being a master manipulator and charmer. I pray for the safety and health of those women from his past, and I pray Kevin gets what he deserves in this life. Thank you to everyone listening, and be careful. You never know what the person standing in front of you is truly capable of. Now, I never leave the house without my gun. I always have some type of protection on me or around me at all times. I still get very jumpy from loud knocking at the door and I never walk alone at night. All because of a few experiences that happened to me in the fall of 2015. For reference, I'm a short and small framed female. At the time I was 17 years old, attending a technical college working as a waitress and had just moved into my first apartment. I never worried about living on my own, and I never really thought anything weird or creepy would ever happen to me. The day I moved in, I went to the leasing office to sign some paperwork, and that's when I first saw him. The maintenance man was an extremely tall, slightly older man, probably in his late 40s with dark short hair, dark bags under his eyes, and tan aged skin. I couldn't help but notice him trying to discreetly watch me while fumbling in the leasing office fridge trying to look busy. He gave me the weirdest feeling and looked at me and other women in the office like pieces of meat. I tried to ignore it and went back to my new apartment to unpack. Unfortunately for me, I ended up with an apartment on the third floor, so getting everything up the three flights of stairs was quite a chore. However, I did enjoy the view the apartment's balcony had of the city. That week, I began working as a waitress for a restaurant in the shopping center next to the apartment complex. I was so grateful that I worked at a place so close to where I lived because not long after I started there, the crappy car that a sleazy car salesman tricked me into buying, a car that was older than me, broke down again, and this time beyond repair. I'd have to walk to work every day until I got a new car. I didn't mind the walks at first, it was only a five minute walk. I liked the early autumn air, the leaves on the ground, and the few minutes to think before and after my shifts. After a few late shifts, I started feeling uneasy on my walks home. I just had an ominous feeling in the back of my mind, like I was being followed or watched. I tried to rationalize my fears by telling myself that it's just the eeriness of walking in the dark alone, and when I'd look around, I would never see anyone. Seeing as I had to walk from the front of the parking lot to the very back to get to my place didn't help, I thought I'd get used to it eventually and tried to shake it off. Those feelings went on for a couple of weeks until I decided to take an extra day off from my usual schedule and spend the day out with my boyfriend. When we got back to my place, all the lights were off, how I left it, except the one in my bedroom towards the back. We didn't notice at first and continued our conversation as we walked in the door when, all of a sudden, we heard someone say, Uh, maintenance. And the tall, dark figure of the maintenance man came out of our room and stammered about him checking on something, walked past us, and left quickly. How did he just get in? I thought maybe I left the door unlocked and would make a point to make sure it's locked from now on. If that were to happen to me now again, I'd probably tell him off and report it or something. But I was young and didn't think much more about it. Two days later, after I finished the closing chores at work at around 11.30pm, I was walking home deep in thought about the day that I just had. I burned my hand on a plate of fresh food and then dropped two plates all over the floor in front of the customers and was yelled at by my boss and picked on by my coworkers all night. It was an awful shift, and I was so embarrassed and just wanted to shower and crawl into bed. I entered the apartment parking lot when, all of a sudden, I was spooked by the sound of a can rolling on the ground 
and some type of sweeping sound. When I looked behind me, I saw the maintenance man at the front of the parking lot sweeping and occasionally glancing up at me. I didn't think much about it at first and turned to face forward again. As the noise of the sweeping continued, I realized how weird it was that he was still at work so close to midnight. When I turned back to look at him, he was now closer and sweeping as he walked towards my direction. I thought it could just be a coincidence at first, but started walking faster because it was starting to freak me out. I glanced back again, and to my horror, he didn't have the broom anymore, had one hand in his pocket, and was walking straight at me very quickly. I just started running, but when I made it to the stairs that led to my apartment, I didn't slow down. I ran up all three flights of stairs as fast as I could. I felt my heart pumping in my chest as I raced up each step, and when I finally got to the top floor, I looked over the railing, and he made eye contact with me from the bottom of the stairs as he reached them. He had a look in his eyes that sent chills down my spine. It was a mix of desperate, angry, and, I don't know, something darker. After that brief moment, he started running up the stairs after me. I ran over to my door, all while hearing him grunting as he worked his way towards me. I cursed at myself for fumbling the keys in my hands and turned the lock as fast as I could, swung the door open, and slammed it shut and locked it. At a breath, I put my back against the door and tried to process what had just happened. I got rides home from work for several days afterwards, but... I didn't want to keep asking for help, so I told myself that I was overreacting and that it would be fine. Two weeks had passed since the incident happened with the maintenance man. I had almost forgotten about it because I hadn't seen him around at all since. One night off work, I was home alone and studying for some classes and waiting for my boyfriend to get off of work at 2am so he could spend the night. I took a break to make some tea when I thought I heard a sound like breaking glass outside. I didn't pay too much attention to it. I had rowdy neighbors, but they were always so nice and young like I was, and I'm not one to complain. I sat back down with my tea and continued to study. About ten minutes later, I heard a knock at the door. I got up to answer it, and as I reached for the handle, I stopped when I got that familiar, creepy feeling that I get when walking home. I looked through the peephole and it was completely dark out there and my porch light wasn't working, so I couldn't see who it was. I flipped the switch a few more times and thought that that was very strange. I shouted through the door, Who is it? But no one answered. I pressed my ear to the door and could hear that someone was there when they shuffled a bit. I shouted again, If you don't tell me who you are, I won't open the door. After I said that, the person started pounding loudly. I yelped and went into survival mode. The only weapon I could think of in the heat of the moment was a crowbar that I had from the closet and said, I'm going to call the police. And that's when the pounding stopped for a moment. But then I heard a sound that can only be described as like a body being thrown at the door and then a big loud bang. It happened again and then again. I screamed and ran to my bedroom and locked the door and threw myself against it and dialed 911. Holding the crowbar in one hand and the phone in the other, I'd loudly told the operator what was happening, but by that time, I didn't hear the banging anymore. Ten minutes later, an officer came. He knocked and announced himself. Still full of adrenaline and nervous to open the door, I opened the door to a very nice and helpful officer. The officer asked me what happened and after hearing my story, he asked me if any of the bangs sounded lower on the door. I looked at him confused, thinking maybe he was trying to size the person up or something and I answered, I'm not sure why. And that's when he opened the door to reveal several large boot prints in the middle of the door and my porch light smashed. I now knew what that crashing sound was. The cops told me, Luckily, who did this didn't kick right by the door handle because I'm afraid if he had, he would have been successful in kicking the door down. And he pointed to the pathetic little screw that had moved from its socket to the door frame. I don't know why I never told the officer about the maintenance man when he asked me if I could think of anyone that would do this. I might have just been too freaked out to make the connection. Officers patrolled the area that night and a report was filed, but... 
they never found anyone acting suspicious, so there was nothing else that could be done. I later installed extra locks, and my brother-in-law put a screw that was three times as long in the door frame, and I got rides home from work until I moved shortly after. And that's why I always keep protection on me. I had never been in such a scary situation in my life and haven't since. It really changed me. Who knows what would have happened to me if that man had been successful in breaking in. What if he had a gun? Would I even be alive to type this? And sometimes I wonder if it really was that creepy old maintenance man that followed me home that night. A few years ago, my sister, mom, and I decided to go on a girl's trip to Jamaica. I had just turned 18, so I was super excited to be able to legally drink during my trip. The majority of our trip was amazing. We spent most of our time drinking and hanging out on the beach. We stayed at resorts, so we had a private beach, and aside from some stares from a few creepy old men and resort workers, my sister, mom, and I never felt unsafe, and we had a great time. However, this changed at the end of our stay. The day before we were supposed to leave, we had just returned to our room after spending the morning and part of the afternoon on the beach and walking around the resort. The hotel room phone suddenly rang, which we didn't think much of since we assumed it was the front desk asking about our department from the resort. My mom picked up the phone and it was the front desk. They told us that we had a visitor at the gate and the entrance to the resort. My mom asked the staff to describe the visitor or tell her their name since we weren't expecting anybody. The front desk person kept dodging her questions and kept repeating that someone was asking for my mom at the entrance and was refusing to leave, and I started to internally panic. Eventually my mom hung up and she looked and sounded pretty freaked out. About five minutes after the phone call we heard a knock at the door. My mom asked who it was and the person behind the door said it was room service with a male voice. She checked through the peephole and the person was not dressed in any hotel uniform and didn't have any cart or items indicating that they were with room service or the hotel staff. She said that the man was wearing normal street clothes and looked very scary. We didn't answer the door and when we checked again, the man was gone. My mom called my dad who was back home in the United States and told him everything that had happened. That evening, my dad arranged for security to take us back to our room after we went to dinner. He also informed the hotel staff and security about the situation. They escorted us to our room and showed great concern. They were very kind and helpful, making us feel a lot safer. We didn't receive any phone calls or hear any knocks at the door for the rest of the night. We left the next morning and we still don't know the full story regarding who the visitor or the man at the door was, nor their intentions. Maybe they knew that it was just us three girls on the trip without a male and were trying to rob us, or worse. I had a great time on that trip, but that situation really scared me and made me hesitant about traveling without a guy, which is kind of sad when you think about it. Stay safe while traveling, everyone, and always be alert. You never know. What can happen? This happened to me on New Year's Eve of 2021 when I was 17 on a now deleted app called It's Me. It was an app where you can talk to people from all around the world without the fear of showing your face as you created your animated avatar. Looking back, the app was a really enjoyable experience because I met people I'm still friends with today. However, most people who used It's Me could agree that it could get toxic. Many users, including myself, trolled parties, which were basically live streams where a host could allow three other people to talk with them and the party's guests could comment in the chat. One time I was trolling a party when I was new to the app and the host was, unbeknownst to me, quite notorious on the app and already had a large following. Before this, I would never heard of the host, although I knew a couple of her friends. Her name was Kehlani, and mine was Selena's, not my real name. Usually, the people I trolled didn't have the reaction I wanted, i.e. arguing back, but this host started arguing back, and we went back and forth for a while, with the party getting many guests, and the comments were kind of going wild. 
After the party, I texted her on the app, going back and forth with her again until we were full on beefing and I asked her to meet up. Honestly, I didn't want to fight this girl because I was only arguing with her for fun, but she was taking me seriously. She told me she lived in Chicago and I lived in Milwaukee, so I thought that there was no point in driving one hour and a half just to fight a girl I'd never even met. At the time, I was stupid and still had the mindset of a hood rat, so me pulling up to this girl wasn't far-fetched. It got to the point where she wouldn't shut up, so I did something I still regret to this day. I told her that I'd meet her at her place if she was with it, and she accepted. I hopped in my car and put her address in the GPS. Not gonna lie, the apartment building she lived in looked sketchy and ghetto, but I didn't really care because I also was from the hood. I brought my twin sister with me just in case Kaylani had people with her to jump me. As we pulled up, I saw a girl who looked Hispanic, had sneakers and a hoodie on, so I presumed it was her because of her accent and her clothes. I told my sister to wait in the car because she looked to be alone. I ran up to her and we started fighting. Not to brag or anything, but I've been in many fights growing up in the hood, so I do know how to defend myself properly. To be honest, I was getting the best of her when out of nowhere, some guy proceeded to pick me up and try to separate us. At first I thought it was some kind of security for the apartment building, but he wasn't wearing any kind of uniform or anything. Actually, he looked quite a mess looking back, and he reeked of alcohol too. He managed to somehow separate us even though at this point I was going insane crazy and Kaylani was still trying to get little hits in. By this time, my sister came out of the car when she saw the guy getting involved and presumably Kaylani's friends who came from inside the building trying to hold her back. After we were separated, the guy literally started dragging me to a rusty beat-up black Honda that was parked nearby. I started fearing for my life and screamed my sister's name. She came sprinting, but the guy had already opened the trunk and threw me in, trying to shut it. I was kicking and screaming, but he was really strong and managed to shut the trunk. My heart practically stopped when I felt the car speed off, and I can still remember my sister's screams for help. We drove for maybe five minutes, and I'm claustrophobic, so I'm frantically trying to get out of the tiny trunk. I was texting my sis, and luckily she informed me that she called the police already, and she was following the car. After a few minutes, the car stopped, and he lifted the trunk and dragged me by the hair into some house that looked run down and dirty from the outside. He practically threw me into the house, and I saw my sister running after the guy with a baseball bat we brought just in case anything bad was to happen. She managed to get one good hit on the man with the bat, but he kicked her off and locked the door. Even though I heard sirens nearby, I was still terrified of what he was going to do to me. He dragged me into some room in the back of the house, and the whole time I was fighting him off as best I could. The police then burst in a couple of seconds later and tackled the man. Surprisingly, he didn't resist and was quite calm, letting them handcuff him. I was reunited with my sister, and in that moment... I realized how precious life can truly be. Ever since that day, I changed for the better. My sister and I no longer beef with anybody and we've definitely grown up in the past year. After the incident, Kaylani left the app. I decided to call it quits me soon after as well because many people I was cool with started moving on and I wanted to leave the memory of that day behind. I never told anyone on It's Me what happened, not even my friends, as I was afraid no one would believe me. So if there's anything to take away from the story, it's not to make dangerous decisions like I did that day, pulling up to a sketchy neighborhood to fight a stranger. The It's Me app was shut down on August 10th of this year and was replaced with a new app called Codename. Recently, I moved back to England with my sister and we both go to an amazing college here. And I just hope that all of you stay safe and try to grow and be wise. This all started after my mom and dad first got divorced in 2002 when I was four years old. My mom started dating my stepfather who I am very close with to this day and have always considered him a second father because of our love for Star Wars, movies, etc. As for my dad, 
He started dating my stepmother, who will be the focus of this story and will eventually create the childhood trauma me and my older brother had to endure under her, and for the sake of anonymity, if my stepmom or her daughter find this post somehow, it does not get traced back to me. Her name was Rachel. So at first, when my dad started dating Rachel, he lived in a small apartment complex, and one of the days I visited him in 2004, Rachel was there and made a friendly greeting to me and my brother. She also had a daughter, who I'll refer to as Kathy. Eventually, Rachel and my dad would get married in 2005 and then move into a house around five minutes from my mom's house. Little did I know that this would be the beginning of the traumatic experiences I had to endure under my mentally and physically abusive stepmother that would make my childhood a living hell. To start, maybe from 2006 to 2009, Rachel would verbally abuse me and my brother. She would run into the bathroom after me or him got out of the shower and ask if we cleaned our bodies properly, which I know I have. Even when I knew I did, she would somehow believe that I was lying and proceed to either ground me or my brother for the night or proceed to scream at us directly. I was so scared that I sometimes shampooed my hair and cleansed my body about five times. I even sometimes asked my dad to wait for me outside the bathroom because I was that terrified that Rachel would try to scream at me when she heard the running water turn off. The worst moment that happened between that time frame was when I was six years old bathing in the tub. Rachel burst in, grabbed me by the hand, and tried to drown me by pushing my head into the water. These could be the worst things that she had done to me, but I can assure you that it does get worse and more sinister. Something else that would happen during this time was Kathy would make me do something to get me in trouble and pin the blame on me, which she did frequently and would result in Rachel screaming in my ear or even beating me. Another incident that occurred happened when I was 11 years old in 2009 when I was quoting something from a movie that I watched that was dubbed in German. She overheard me and asked, what are you speaking? And I replied with German. She then mockingly says, gerbil? which I still did not get why she said that. And later that day, which was the day my stepsister had a soccer game, me, my dad, brother, Kathy, and Rachel and other family members sat to eat lunch before the game, and Rachel mentions how I was speaking in a different language from earlier that she said was gerbil. I then jokingly said that this would be a big mistake on my part. Shut up. Right when I said this, Kathy, who often would try to get me into trouble often, tattles on me to Rachel and proceeded to walk over and grab me by the arm, drag me to my room, and begin to physically beat me. She slapped and punched me while my family was there. She also screamed at me while I bawled my eyes out and wailed in fear. She did this until she told me to write a sentence of how I would not tell her to shut up and told me that I would write the same sentence until my wrist cramped and I bled. I tried telling my dad about this, but due to his ignorance and blind love for Rachel, he didn't believe me and believed anything she said. I wanted to tell my mother, but because of my young naivety, I never did out of fear at the time that she wouldn't believe me or that she would tell my dad what I said and then Rachel would find out what I told her. The abuse continued when Rachel would sometimes walk into my room while I was sleeping in the early mornings and punch me in the face over and over and verbally threaten me. For the next incident, this would be the one incident that would be the most traumatic, fear-inducing moment of my childhood and one that I will never forget because it would lead to the most traumatic moment of my childhood that I still sometimes have nightmares about to this very day. And this happened in August of 2011 after I turned 13 a few weeks earlier. I remember that it was storming outside which caused floods to occur in my area during which me and Kathy were playing battleship in the living room. At some point, the basement was flooded and Rachel, I suppose at the time, walked down there and found that a doll had its arms detached from it. While playing battleship, Rachel tells me to come with her and at the time, I had no clue what she wanted and proceeded to ask me, did you break this doll? Watch, I replied, no, I did not. She then kept pressing me to tell the truth even though I knew for sure I was as I never touched or broke some stupid doll that she had and eventually I had no choice but to say that I did despite my initial honesty. She proceeded to grab me and then punched and slapped me in the face really hard. 
She said that my family, including my mother, grandparents, and siblings, do not love me. She claimed that I would never find any form of happiness because in her mind I was being dishonest, a selfish person that nobody would want to be around. She then told me to stay in my room while I cried and occasionally came in to beat or scream at me more. This incident would haunt her mind and she would constantly mention it in front of my dad who somehow blindly believed her. It escalated to the point where my brother and I refused to visit my dad again, leading me to seek therapy for my trauma. And this happened in September 2011 when I first started school and I was reading A Series of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Snicket. I was always an avid reader and books had always helped me cope with my trauma, transporting me to another world. While I was reading, Rachel entered my room and said, You're sneaky, and I'm going to bury you alive. And this threat of possibly being murdered terrified me, and I wanted to call my mom to come pick me up. At some point, I asked my dad if I could call mom, and he allowed me to do so. As I tried to talk to her, I began to cry and couldn't get the words out. However, both my mom and dad understood what I was saying and that Rachel had indeed threatened to bury me alive along with my brother. My dad confronted Rachel and a few minutes later, my mom picked my brother and me up to take us home. I remember when I got home, I approached my stepdad, a big gentle giant, and he gave me a big hug, assuring me that everything would be okay. And then my mom hugged me too, repeating those comforting words. My mom later told me that my brother and I would no longer be visiting my dad's house as long as Rachel was around. I could no longer visit my dad while he was still married to Rachel. After that, I did see her occasionally and tried to play nice, but I didn't fall for it. Unfortunately, this strained my relationship with my dad to the point where I considered estranging myself from him if he remained married to Rachel while attending high school. Whenever Rachel was around, I was always distant because of all the pain and suffering she had caused me and everyone around her. The last time I saw her was about seven years ago when my dad, my brother, Rachel and I met for dinner at a pizza joint. The following year when I graduated from high school and prepared to attend a university, my dad and Rachel got divorced. Looking back, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the reasons for the divorce had something to do with the abuse she inflicted on me and my older brother. My dad and I were able to reconnect and start a fresh relationship after their divorce. He told me about some of the things that Rachel had done to him, such as preventing him from visiting my brother and me without her and using other methods to control him. I'm glad that he was able to see what a truly awful person Rachel is. I'm currently doing well, having graduated from college and secured my first job in software development two years ago. I'll be getting an apartment with a close friend I've known for years this coming May. I also see a therapist to talk about my PTSD, depression, and social anxiety stemming from the ordeal Rachel put me through. And I hope this story helps those who might be struggling with an abusive family member. I promise you that things will eventually work out, and the abuse you're enduring now will come to an end, allowing you to enjoy the happy life that you deserve. As for you, Rachel, if you ever come across this post, you are a truly horrible human being who deserves no happiness in your life. I'll never forgive you for the abuse and PTSD you inflicted on me during my childhood. I hope you find no peace, and I pray I never have to see you in my life or my family's life ever again. Last November in 2021, my roommate and two friends and I went to our first concert since the lockdown in downtown Seattle. We had quit smoking during that time, but as it was a special occasion and an old tradition, we decided to split a pack to share. It was a post-punk concert, The Idols, and it was more frugal to indulge in tobacco rather than the criminally overpriced drinks at the bar. The show had a late start as the lead singer was suffering from a case of food poisoning, but he later pulled it off like a champ, a real pro. And by the time the show was about to start, it was getting late, and the roommate and I were halfway through the pack of cigarettes. We would go off around the block of the venue to a quiet corner on the sidewalk of an intersection with a four-way stop and crosswalks, where a few surviving bars were still open across the street. This was the tail end of lockdown, so there were far fewer people wandering around. 
Now neither roommate nor I normally smoke cloves as our nicotine of choice. At the gas station I asked for a pack of menthols, but then I impulsively switched to clove cigarettes, which had a fewer in pack and were slightly more expensive to savor the flavor. My roommate wasn't as thrilled about my selection, but hey, we could give the extras away rather than take the rest home and restart a bad habit. The show was finally about to start after a 45 minute delay. It was just the two of us alone without any fellow smokers on the sidewalk of the intersection as we indulged in destroying our lungs and throats. We were both reminiscing about past shows when a man in his early 40s walked past us to cross the street with a green crosswalk glowing brightly in the chilly November night. The man took one step into the streets and paused, one foot on the sidewalk and the other in the road, long enough for both myself and roommate to take notice and wait for a reaction to this odd behavior, as this was kind of part of a rough neighborhood. Then the man abruptly turned around and approached us with a sort of sheepish grin to ask if he could bum a cigarette. Roommate and I relaxed as the man's behavior was him losing the battle with temptation, as we admittedly did ourselves. As I held out my smokes, a sports car blew through the red light. It was right at that moment the man would have been halfway across the street. I have no doubt in my mind that he would have been killed instantly or both roommate and I would have been dead or horribly injured if the driver had tried to swerve and lost control of the car. In two blinks, the sports car was gone, peeling down the street like a complete idiot at around 60 miles per hour in a 20 mile per hour zone. It was a real did that really just happen moment, and roommate and I exchanged a stunned WTF look at each other as the man rambled, and I quote, how he hadn't smoked clove cigarettes in 15 years, and the scent was too much to resist. The poor guy never heard the speeding car nor realized how close he was to becoming a bloody smear on the pavement. He thanked us for the clove and finished crossing the street, still with a solid green crosswalk light happily smoking away as he made his way into one of the bars. If I had not given in to my last-minute impulse to buy cloves instead of menthols, that man would have been dead, with roommate and me caught in the crossfire. The car was driving so fast that nobody had heard it coming, and my roommate and I have quit since smoking, and we still occasionally talk about it, how vivid that moment has ingrained into our minds of that man standing with one foot in the road and the other on the sidewalk, a moment when an invisible coin was tossed with the three of us and that stupid driver's fate all in the air. And I still get chills thinking about it. My name is Haley. I'm 17 years old and I live in a northern state in the United States. I've been trying to sleep for a couple of hours, so I thought I might as well share the story because I can't get it off my mind. Yesterday was my biological dad's birthday. I'm not sure how old he turned this year. He abandoned my sister and I when we were kids, and we were raised by our stepdad, but that really isn't relevant to the story, so I'll just get back to it. Today was his birthday, my biological father, and my boyfriend A and my younger sister K and I decided to go celebrate with his side of the family. Now my biological father is homeless and he has been for years. The state we live in is very cold and it snows often and today it was 25 degrees all day long, but my biological dad says he likes living this way, his choice I guess. Usually my aunt, AR, will go look for him today. We knew that he was staying in some sort of junkyard underneath the camper shell, but when AR went there today, she found out that it had been bulldozed and D was nowhere to be found. She looked for him all over, but he was nowhere to be found, and she gave up and drove the 30 minutes to my uncle G's house. Even though my biological dad wasn't there, we still celebrated his birthday without him. A, K, and I left after a couple of hours, but before we left... My aunt said that she was going to look for my biological dad again. It was on her way home anyways. Now thinking that she would find him, I told her to call me and let me know if she did, and A and K and I would meet them somewhere. A has never met my biological dad before, and A and I have only been together for seven months, and he really wanted to meet him. I was home for less than an hour, and then we got the call from my aunt, and she said that she found my dad. 
We all got in my car and drove the 30 minutes to go meet up with them. Since my dad doesn't have a warm place to live, and it was already pitch black outside in less than 20 degrees, we met up at Denny's. This Denny's was closed for some reason, so we were the only two cars in the parking lot. As soon as I put the car in park, my biological dad got out of the passenger side door and walked up to my car. The three of us hesitantly got out and said hi. He hugged Kay and I and shook A's hand, and my aunt then said, I have to head home. My kids are supposed to be in bed at 8, and she got in her car and pulled out of the parking lot. My biological dad turns and says, Want to see my old house? I looked at A and K to see if they were okay with this, and they just shrugged their shoulders. The four of us got into my car. My biological dad took the passenger seat instead of A, and as soon as I turned on the car and the heat started, all I could smell was dirt. I don't mean the smell of after it rains, I mean the smell of dirt being blown through the air. I instantly knew that it was my dad. We pulled out of the parking lot and headed to where dad used to live. When we got there, he showed us around and told me that he wanted to show us where he's living now, and we agreed and started driving across town. When we got there, I instantly got a bad feeling. We got out of the car and walked behind the trees into a ditch. He's showing us all that he's done, and I can't help but feel like something bad is about to happen. I convince my dad to continue our conversation back in the car, and he thankfully agrees and we safely make it back to the car, but I can't shake this awful feeling in my gut. I immediately lock the door and continue the conversation. I look, and D and his eyes are wide while he's talking. He looks like he's planning something, something I can't figure out. I pretend like everything is normal, but my gut is screaming at me to leave as fast as possible. My dad starts rambling about how he's a savior, and how the world needs to be cleansed, how people come to him for guidance, and that he says something that makes my heart drops. One day, I'm going to do something, and they're going to shoot me in the head. I decide to just end it there, and I drop him off at the end of the street. He finally gets out and says, I love you guys, and you too, you're, you're all children of God, which makes you my siblings. A climbs into the front seat and shuts the door. I immediately drive away and burst into tears. The entire drive home, my boyfriend and I, A, talk about what happened, and the crazed look in my dad's eyes, how eerie the whole interaction with him was. And now it's two in the morning and I can't sleep and I can't stop thinking about his eyes. It was like he was staring into me and reading my mind. Now I know this isn't as scary as the other stories on the subreddit, but I just needed to get this off of my chest, for my sake. Let me start by saying that I'm a big fan of Let's Read and I've been listening for a while now. Just recently I watched your video about EMT and other emergency service stories and decided that I wanted to share some of my own stories. I'm a male in my 30s, an RN, and I've been working in a pediatric ED for almost a decade now. Most people who meet me outside of work hear that I work in a kid's ER and assume that I deal with runny noses and boo-boos all day. Well, that certainly comes with the territory. We are still an emergency room, and on top of that, we are designated a trauma center. This means that we get all types of crazy cases either walking through the front door or being flown in by helicopter. We're talking about a toddler who shot himself between the eyes with his dad's roommate's handgun, a narcissistic preteen taking pictures of his unclothed little sister and selling them on the internet, and a car accident so bad that the driver's limbs were almost completely severed. All of these stories deserve lengthy explanations in themselves, but... I'd like to share a case that I experienced when I was a newer nurse, working in our trauma zone. While I wasn't directly assigned to the trauma rooms that day, I was stationed close enough that I could see and hear everything that was going on. It started with an EMT radio call about a six-year-old boy who got his arm caught in a meat grinder. The EMTs were bringing the boy along with the meat grinder so you could guess it was more than just a little stuck. I had a clear view of the gurney while the paramedics rolled through the ambulance bay and I could see that the word caught was a gross understatement. This boy's arm was completely through the meat grinder all the way up to the elbow, maybe even a little further. 
On the other end was just a little jumble of thin ribbons of flesh. I looked at the boy's face, and he had just a blank stare, not making a sound. I could see the complete shock, his brain unable to comprehend the situation yet, and when I say meat grinder, I'm not talking about one of those old hand crank ones you get at Walmart. We're talking about an industrial strength electric meat grinder bolted to the kitchen counter. The EMTs had to unbolt the machine from the counter before they could load the kid into the ambulance. There wasn't much bleeding with the grinder still in the arm and the kid was stable, but the trauma surgeon made sure the OR was ready upstairs in case the grinder was removed and the arm started gushing blood. We had to call the maintenance team just to disassemble this thing piece by piece. The arm didn't start bleeding profusely once the machine was removed, thank God, but the kid was sent directly to the OR. After the dust settled, we get word of the whole story. Turns out that the kid was at his grandmother's house, and the grandmother had the terrible idea to have the kid help her grind up meat to make a meal. This lady was having this six-year-old boy shove chunks of meat into an industrial-strength meat grinder. Well, when this grandmother heard the boy screaming and turned her head to see his arm being pulled halfway through the machine, she quickly hit the kill switch and called an ambulance. While waiting for the ambulance, she became so distraught and guilt-ridden with the whole situation that she picked up a kitchen knife from the counter and started stabbing herself in the chest. When the ambulance arrived at the house and went into the kitchen, they found the grandmother with the knife in her chest and had to call in a second ambulance to take her to an adult trauma center. Picture the six-year-old boy standing there with his arm through a meat grinder, watching his grandmother stab herself in the chest. Just a few weeks ago, I actually spoke with a traveling nurse at our facility who was on the team back then that worked on the grandmother. I found out, probably unsurprisingly, that the grandmother did not make it. I'd like to start by mentioning that I'm a 33-year-old male currently working as a superintendent for a downtown condo building in a large city. I have been threatened, yelled at, kicked countless unsavory types of people off property, and cleaned up things I'd rather not talk about. Having said that, I would still consider the following story one of the worst times in my life. This might be a little long-winded as it happened over a few years, so please bear with me. This is not a creepy or terrifying story like most here, so if that's what you're looking for, this isn't that story, but when I think back on it, it still gives me anxiety and quite a bit of a shiver. This story is about mental and emotional manipulation from someone I thought that I could trust during a time I was exceptionally vulnerable. In 2016, I was single, living in a big city with one of my best friends. I was unknowingly desperate for validation and throwing myself out there on dating apps as much as possible. Looking back, it's easy to see how I let insecurities and traumas manipulate my actions, but self-awareness is never as easy as we want to believe. I sought validation from anyone I was at all attracted to, regardless of whether or not we were really compatible, and I honestly prioritized it much higher than I should have in my life. I was getting dates here and there and seeing someone casually, but neither of us were committing and, alas, my search continued for more women to validate my worth. So, one day, I received a friend request on Facebook from a seemingly random woman. Her name will be Maria for the story. After further digging, I found that Maria and I had a mutual friend, a good friend of mine who lived in another city nearby, and we'll call her Sarah. So, naturally, I inquired with Sarah about who this person was. It turns out Maria was a single mom friend of Sarah's, and one day, while they were hanging out, Sarah had gone through her Facebook friends looking for possible dates for Maria. I guess I had caught Maria's eye, and she found me on Sarah's friend list later. Sarah had nothing but great things to say about her, so I accepted her request, and we almost immediately started talking daily. We had minimal interests in common, but conversation with her came so easily and she was cute. Put this together with her showing genuine interest in me and all my younger self's boxes were checked. The chemistry seemed unmistakable and it wasn't long before we planned a day to meet. 
She found the babysitter for her son for the night and even offered for me to stay the night so we could have a few drinks. We had some wine at her place while talking some more about ourselves and then went out for dinner at a restaurant she recommended for some great sangria. The whole night was amazing. We were both definitely feeling the booze by the time we went to bed, but neither of us were drunk. We started making out, and things seemed to be going further. At this point, I felt this sense of duty to let her know that I was seeing other people, but nothing serious. She seemed a bit disappointed, but also understood. Things kept progressing, and we can all assume what happened from here. Afterward, though, she was suddenly very upset saying that I lied to her and didn't mention any other girls before. I tried to explain to her that I was waiting to see where this went, as we had been playing things off very friendly, and that she also had not asked before, but this wasn't a reasonable excuse for her. Like she wasn't kicking me out, but all of a sudden she was accusing me of betrayal and dishonesty, and she eventually calmed down, but it did ruin the night and the mood. We went to sleep and I left the next morning with a bit of an awkward ambiance around us. This should have been more of a red flag, but, you know, validation. We continued to talk and the whole incident seemed to disappear. Her expectations of where things were going were moving very fast and this was apparently more of a deal breaker for me than the sudden outburst. Tie that together with how far and unavailable she was and we slowly drifted apart. However. We did stay Facebook friends. Time goes by and I move to another city in another province. I'm living there for a little under a year. The girl I was seeing broke up with me, and to make it worse, an actual quote from her was, I don't know if I like you or if you're just all I have. After this, I slowly realized that I'm not happy there. I'm feeling very lonely and unknowingly. My need for validation is higher than ever. Then, out of the blue, Maria starts messaging me again. The conversation comes as easy as before, and it's not long before things become very flirty. Neither of us are jumping into anything, especially with the kid involved, but the idea of me moving to her city did become a popular topic. It was easy to justify it, as it was close to my hometown, but still a larger town where I can gain work experience. Eventually, it was decided that I was moving there. The next thing to figure out was how, so I started looking at jobs and apartments, but this was fairly difficult, being about six hours away. However, given that I was fairly experienced and skilled in my profession as a chef, it wasn't long before I had several to choose from. This left the only problem to finding a place to live, not to mention I had another year on my current lease, so I had to find a sublet. The job I found was expecting me by the beginning of April. I had a serious application for the sublet of my place, but the process was taking a long time, and I still hadn't found a place in the new town. The time crunch was getting real. And this is when Maria and I made a decision that would set up all the terrible things to come. We decided that I would stay with Maria and her son until I found a place to live. We figured it would give us more time to get more acquainted and see where things go as well. She could also see how her son and I were together with him, thinking I was just a friend visiting. Meanwhile, I panicked with the sublet and gave him the keys early since I didn't want to come all the way back and I saw no reason for him to be denied. The apartment hunt was much harder than expected, but the first couple of weeks or so were going so well anyway that neither of us minded. Her son seemed to love me too. She insisted on doing all the cooking and cleaning as she only worked part-time. I occupied her son while she was busy. We had time alone while her son slept and everything seemed perfect. Everything changed when I received a call from the property company of my old apartment. The guy who I thought was a sure shot to take the apartment had been advertising the place on Airbnb which was absolutely not allowed. So of course, he was denied the sublet and the apartment was still on me. I didn't have time to go back to show it to people so the company offered me a deal. I paid four months rent and they would cancel my lease. Given my limited options, I took the deal. However, this sent me back in my apartment search as I couldn't afford two apartments, so my stay with Maria became extended. Fortunately, no one seemed to mind. We were all getting along really well and although reckless and unorthodox, this made us think that I might not need to find an apartment. 
oh how blind love can be. It wasn't long before the fairy tale slowly started to unravel though. It started off with small things. I'd come home to her in a rage for no indicated reason. She was drinking a bottle of wine almost every day. Her mood and personality were just getting generally hard to predict. It was hard to bring up any touchy subjects as she would be immediately defensive and hostile. Eventually though, the incidents escalated. One day, we both had the day off and her son was at school so she suggested that we go day drinking by a waterfall nearby. It was a beautiful day so this seemed like a good reason to enjoy it and we had a lot of fun. We talked about various subjects, some casual, some deeper. At one point, we talked about her childhood and parents. Her dad was emotionally abusive. Another relative actually abused her intimately and her mom was bipolar. And before I could even ask, she told me that she was tested for bipolar disorder and that she was clear. She was tested for this while she briefly checked herself in for mental instability. And this was all news to me. Yet instead of raising any sort of red flags, I just felt bad for her and thought that she was well adjusted for what she went through. One subject we got on, though, was about to make a real problem. Kids. We started talking about kids and names. We joked that if we had a girl, we would name her Barbara and Gordon as her middle name after Batgirl. It all seemed very lighthearted until she suggested that we try to have a child. Keeping in mind, we had been seeing each other for maybe two and a half months. However, I was quite buzzed and apparently susceptible to opinions, so I agreed. We were sober before her son even got home and I was already regretting that conversation, especially knowing how confrontational she can be. The next, I realized her decision was not inhibited, not by the alcohol anyways. She announced that she was already off her birth control with a huge smile on her face. And for a day or so, I tried to rationalize this as a good choice, but nothing about it seemed right. So I told her how I felt and that I think it was the alcohol talking before. Not that I didn't want to have a baby, but I didn't want to rush into it. Well, to tell you she wasn't happy would be the understatement of the decade. She absolutely flipped on me, guilting me about already stopping her birth control and how I wasn't serious about her and I. Through all of this, she somehow convinced me to change my mind or at least go along with her decisions to stop birth control. It basically became whatever happens, happens situation. A few times I actually had a hard time actually getting excited during intimate moments and she would immediately guilt me about not wanting her to get pregnant and she was absolutely right but that doesn't help the situation and it definitely didn't help me sort of feel anything. I know it's probably hard to believe that I put up with this but she really made me feel like I was the problem and I thought I loved her. Not to mention I felt that I had nowhere to go. Now Maria also took some other medication daily a new one was for IBS, but the other I wasn't sure and I decided to let her tell me when she felt up to it. I found out later that it was an anxiety disorder medication, and I did read the label at one point though and it said not to drink on this medication. When I asked her about this, I got some half-bottom answer about how it was nothing to worry about, and once again, I ignored a very obvious red flag. Sometime in early June, we've been frequenting the dispensary nearby for weed cookies and we've been learning about CBD as treatment for illnesses in place of pills. Maria gets the idea that this could be a great replacement for her medication. We both try some CBD oil, as I deal with anxiety as well. I don't really notice any difference, but she seems pleased with the results. It's not long before she stops her meds completely and switches to CBD oils. She's in a great mood and seems to be thriving. I assumed that she had consulted her doctor about this at some point, but I was very wrong. Within 24 hours, she was really ill, to the point that she had to call her doctor. It turns out she was displaying typical signs of withdrawal from recklessly stopping her meds cold turkey. She had to spend the next couple of days recovering, but I unfortunately had to go to another city to write my red seal test for cooking. This test was to qualify me for a certification in my trade and it took months in advance to book. I couldn't rebook it. I stayed with some good friends of mine the night before since the test was scheduled for 8am the next morning. That night, I'm hanging out with my friends when I get a call from Maria. 
She says that her son wanted to say goodnight to me, but she sounds off. She's pretending to sound happy, but doing a really bad job at it. After I say goodnight to her son, she's still acting kind of strange. She's asking me what I'm doing, asking if I'm doing anything else while I'm there. I say, no, just hanging out here like I mentioned. She asked me some other cryptic questions and then said goodnight. It seemed weird and left me feeling a bit uneasy. I didn't want to trouble my friends though, so I pretended everything was fine. The next morning, I go to write my test. This test can take upwards of three hours, and you have to turn off your phone for the duration as a measure to cut back on cheating, so after roughly two hours, I emerge from radio silence, feeling very unsure of my efforts in the test. What makes me more uneasy, though, is the numerous missed calls I have from Maria. She left a message on my answering machine asking me to get home as soon as possible. She didn't answer the phone when I tried to call back, so I rushed back as fast as one can on public transit. The commute back was two hours of agony, wondering what I might come back to. I burst through the front door and into our bedroom, and she was in bed lying down, emotionless, like... She had not just left me distressing messages a few hours prior. Apparently the withdrawal was hitting her hard for a bit and it was hard to take care of her son at the time. She was annoyed that I didn't pick up, even though she knew that I was writing my test. When I said I rushed back as fast as possible, she didn't seem to believe me. I apologized and assured her that I didn't even stop for food or a bathroom before saying I was there now and I can take care of whatever. She told me not to worry about it in a very cold tone. The pride I felt finally writing a test to further my career was completely overshadowed by the feeling of letting Maria down. It wasn't until a few days later that I found out what she was actually upset about while I was out of town, and this is how she told me the story. Her son wanted to say goodnight to me while I was at my friend's for the night. He grabbed my tablet from the nightstand thinking it was Maria's. He then opened Facebook Messenger to find my name before Maria realized that he was doing it and took it. At this point, the tablet was opened to my Facebook Messenger and she started looking at who I had been talking to. And this apparently was what upset her, and she brought it up a few days after the incident. It should be noted that I had knowingly left my tablet with no lock on it because I only used it in the house and I had nothing to hide. So after trying to ignore it, she breaks down and confronts me about it. She's accusing me of flirting with girls from then till before I even moved there. I tried explaining each instance to her, but she wouldn't listen. One was an argument with an ex that I had about why she could be just friends with me. I was the one saying that we could stay platonic friends, by the way. Each instance was either before we were dating or not flirting at all, but she wouldn't hear it. She continued to cut me down about how disrespectful it was and how she let me into her home and that's how I treated her. She finished by saying that I should probably find another place to live as soon as possible and ask for her key back because I couldn't be trusted there alone. I somehow ended up feeling like I had messed up. I even texted our mutual friend Sarah to tell her that I had messed up big and I feel so terrible and that I was sorry I hurt her friend. To my surprise, when I explained it, she didn't see how I did anything that bad. She said that she would talk to Maria, but it did little to help. The next couple of days, I was sleeping on the couch and desperately looking for temporary housing until I paid the rest of my old apartment off. I felt so uncomfortable being in the apartment with all her guilt on me. I guess I felt I deserved the discomfort, though. The uncomfortable living situation was shorter-lived than I even I expected, though. A couple of days later... Maria isn't feeling 100%, but she is feeling a bit better about me that particular day. She asks if I'll pick her son up from school, and the school is only about a 10-minute walk away. About two blocks away, with a park between the two blocks, and eager to regain her favor, I happily accept. Now, Sometimes she lets him play in the park after on the playground, but she told me to just bring him straight home that day. So... I meet him at the school entrance and we started heading home and with no surprise, he wants to go to the playground. I tell him no. His mom said that we have to come straight home. I wasn't worried as he was generally a very well behaved kid. Besides a little pouting, he usually understands that he needed to listen to his mom. Today though, today he had a full blown meltdown. He cried, argued, walked really slow. I tried to console him but nothing worked. 
anything short of playing in the park was not good enough. When we got close to the far side of the park, about ten feet from the sidewalk and road we had to cross, he stops and just refuses to move. I tell him we need to go and he starts crying and screaming, telling me I'm not his dad and that I can't tell him what to do. I cannot tell you how scary the situation was on its own. I'm in a park with a small boy, screaming and saying that I'm not his dad. I thought the cops would be called on me. Well, I'm trying my best to coax him in the direction of home, so I put my hand on his upper back and try to guide him. He steps forward dramatically and says that I was trying to push him in the street. He then starts walking home. There's a split second of relief until he informs me he's telling my mom that I tried to push him into the street. I think, well, this is another annoyance, but Maria can defuse it. There's no way she'll believe I would do that. I think you can probably guess that I was dead wrong. We walk in the door, and the son runs to Maria, immediately telling her what he claims I did. I could not believe it when she looked at me with the most disgusted look, asking if this was true. I of course told her it was absolutely not true and explained the situation, to which she responded asking why her son would lie about this. Well, he's a child, who's upset that he didn't get his way. You don't need to be a parent to know kids are like that sometimes. She wasn't having any of it though. I should mention this isn't the first time she snapped at me for calling her son a liar. She sends her son to his room before telling me I needed to leave. She said she couldn't trust me and I needed to find somewhere else to go. And I was speechless. I had no idea how to even defend against such unreasonable accusations. And eventually, I had to accept my fate and look for somewhere else to go. I had no other close friends in the city with room for me, but my friends who I stayed with for my Red Seal test offered their couch. So I packed as much as I could carry and headed there as quickly as I could manage, all the while trying to keep a strong front up like I wasn't at an all-time low in my life. I still feel one of my biggest mistakes was covering the worst parts of the situation. If more of my friends, more than just Sarah, knew the full extent of what was going on, they probably would have made me see some common sense. There were three of my friends living in this apartment. My best friend since grade 8, his girlfriend and his brother. All had cars they didn't always use, so between them, they usually had a car for me to use, since I was still working in the other city. Otherwise, I would make the long commute by bus and train, and I'm feeling like a worthless human at this point, basically homeless, stuck in a situation where I can't even afford my own place, and I feel like I've single-handedly messed up the relationship. At the same time, Maria is still in contact with me, making me feel that there is still a chance to fix things. However, she's keeping me at arm's length and making me feel like I'm not trying hard enough if I'm not readily available to come by or talk over the phone. One day I had to work at 6.30am the next morning so I planned to crash at Sarah's uncle's place where she's currently staying. My friend lent me his car and I headed out that night only to find out that she wouldn't be home for some reason. I didn't know her uncle at all so I couldn't just show up. I have a hard time asking anyone for help as it is so I told her it's no problem and I can find somewhere else. This was a lie as I had nowhere else to call but I didn't want it to be her problem. So when I thought I was already at my lowest, I found myself parking at the same park that I walked through to pick up Maria's son. Only this time, it was a place to sleep. I felt fortunate to have the car, but I still felt ashamed. I didn't tell anyone about that night for a long time as I didn't want any more pity. Fortunately, I did find room to sublet for July and August at a cheap rate. Then by September, I would be clear of the other apartment. Maria was still holding hope over my head like an animal being coaxed to run on a treadmill, putting in the effort but unknowingly making no progress. Simultaneously, she was beating down my self-esteem, gaslighting me, emphasizing any mistake I made, constantly bringing up that she can't trust me with everything I did. She made me believe it all for some time. At one point, she told me her building had found out that I was living there when I moved my stuff out and they charged her $300 for it. I had no way to prove this, but it made a bit of sense as she lived in a geared-to-income housing. Not to mention I still felt like trash and felt everything was my fault, so I didn't fight it at all. The thing that makes me question this now is how mad she was at me at this time, but still only asking for half the money. 
Knowing how ruthless she could be, I find it suspicious that she would take any responsibility and suggest splitting the cost. Even though I was holding out hope for Maria, I once again felt that I needed for validation. More than ever, now that my confidence was beaten into the ground, I started using dating apps again, looking for anyone who would boost my ego and self-worth a bit, even though I was still hung up on Maria. I did manage to connect with a couple of people. One woman in particular became a regular talk and hangout. She was also in another city with no car, so it was easy to justify keeping it casual. Well, one day, I dropped by Maria's to give her something and she asked if I wanted to stay for a bit. I desperately wanted to, but I had already made plans with this other girl. I couldn't bring myself to lie when Maria started prying about my plans. When I told her I had plans with another girl, she saw this as more proof of how untrustworthy I was. She said that if we were ever to work, I couldn't see other people. Keep in mind that Maria and I were not romantically involved at this point. We didn't talk often, we barely saw each other, there were no dates or talks or romantic plans. She just didn't want me dating anyone else while she toyed with me. Of course, I couldn't see through this though, so once I again left feeling like I messed everything up. I didn't cut the other girl off completely, but I definitely kept my distance, hoping that I could still make things right. By September, Sarah and her boyfriend had offered for me to live with them as they were getting a place together. So we found a two-bedroom apartment, which happened to be only two blocks from Maria. Sarah had originally tried to stay neutral through this whole situation, but as time went on, she saw how Maria was. Maria would accuse Sarah of hiding with me or being a terrible friend, among other things. Then she would flip and leave her messages saying that her son missed Auntie Sarah and that they should hang out. Sarah had enough and just cut her off, said she was using her child as manipulation and that was the last straw. Although I didn't realize it at the time, Sarah's disconnect from Maria and overall support really helped me distance myself from Maria. It wasn't overnight, but I remember starting to realize how terrible she was little by little. It wasn't easy cutting off someone I thought that I loved, and it became easier as her disguise unraveled. Eventually, we got into an argument one day, and I said that I was done with her. Her defense was trying to use her son again, saying that I couldn't just leave him like that. This really solidified it for me. I was happier. I was meeting other women. A big weight was lifting off my chest. Admittedly, I didn't block her at first. She was not in a great financial situation and I sometimes lent her money. Even after I told her off, she still reached out once in a while saying that she needed money for something for her son. Even though I knew it was more manipulation, I couldn't help myself and this took another year to quit. It's worth noting that she always said that she would pay me back and never did. When I finally did quit this, I blocked her. A few months later, I got a call from a private number. My best friend had his number as private, so I answered. I'm sure you can guess who it really was. Maria greeted me on the other end. It turns out that setting your number to private will get you around your number being blocked, although she claimed it was set to private for another reason. She went on to explain that she had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which explained a lot of what was happening with her. However, she went on to say how this showed that the way she treated me wasn't her fault. It was the BPD. There was no apology, no regrets, none of that. At this point, I lost it on her. She thought a diagnosis wiped the slate clean of any guilt, and I made sure that she knew that wasn't the case. A disorder explains your behavior. It doesn't excuse it. She still owed me an apology, at least, but she refused, still claiming it wasn't her fault and that my actions were still somewhat to blame. I asked if she was taking anything or getting any help, and all she said was, I struggle to work through it every day of my life. I assumed to make me pity her, and I said that I was done. If she couldn't own her mistakes, then she wasn't any better with that diagnosis. I told her as much, and then I hung up for good. I didn't realize at the time, but I think I needed that closure. It felt empowering to tell her how I felt about everything that happened and then deny her any forgiveness or access to my life again. It may sound heartless, but if things had gone differently, I would have been happy to forgive. Hey friends, thanks for listening. 
click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, girl, dinner.